to start this course, what I want to do is to walk through some history of the treatment of traumatic stress and starting in the 19th century and then come all the way up here to, um, to July of 2017 when we just published our article about that process in the, in the Journal of um, Counseling and Development. <clears throat> so um, let's start that with, with looking at the 19th, oops, wrong computer. Um, starting lo looking at the 19th century. And I want to start with, with these two folks right here. Um, this is Pierre Janet. This is um, uh, Jean Charcot, C-H-R-C-O-T. Um, and these two folks were um, at the neurologist, psychiatrist at the, I'm not French is awful, Salpitre in, in, in Paris. Circa um, 1882, 83 was when they started publishing. Um, the mid 1880s, what had happened was Pierre Janet had developed an effective treatment for post traumatic stress that was non abreactive, um, that did not have catharsis. It was um, it was a memory integration process. It was um, helping survivors at the time what they were the treatment for hysteria which was what trauma was called back then um traumatic stress was called and the treatment for hysteria mostly was uh was just rest and in, in, in sanatorium sanitariums always get those two confused um in hospitals and um they it would just just lay about um, and uh, inactivity. And what uh, Janet did was began to engage them in, in activities, um, had them cook on their own meals, clean in their rooms, uh, gardening, engaging in exercise was, was, was got them active. And then was doing individual therapy with helping them to, um, to integrate narrate their trauma memories using mesmerism, hypnosis. And he was having good success with that, and he wrote about it and, uh, um, and published several articles in the late 1880s. And um, in the mid, I think it was 1885, um, Sigmund Freud came to, to Paris and spent a year with Jeunet, and um, he... He got, you know, by all accounts, got pretty excited about uh, that work. And when he went back to um, Vienna in 1886, he had brought to the Vienna School this idea that, that what was called the cause of hysteria was sexual abuse. And um, I think that uh, a lot of the, the the folks on the Vienna School were saying that there's there's no way there's that much sexual abuse in Europe. Um, you need to come up with something else. And Freud not wanting to lose his seat at the table in 1889, you know, historically recanted. Um, he, he left the seduction theory, the seduction hypothesis, and he, um, he began, you know, not wanting to lose his seat at the table of the Vienna school. He constructed the, the, the drive theory, so that, you know, what became psychodynamic psychotherapy and it proliferated, it eclipsed everything. And buried a lot, uh, buried all of this work that, that, that you know it, it just languished. Nobody paid any attention to it until in the 1980s um, that some some scholars began Bessel van der Kolk and Anna van der Hart began digging into that work and started seeing that that there was an effective treatment that did memory integration that was non abreactic abreactive in uh, back in the the late 1800s and it just you know it's been 100 years buried. And it's kind of a really interesting story and travesty to the field, I think, because uh, there was not much evolution of trauma treatment under the umbrella of psychodynamic. And um, this is just a, a, a picture of Odysseus, um, because that's, that really, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey really represent um, some of the first writing on the effects of trauma, really, I mean, uh, when you look at, at Homer's writing through the lens of trauma, you just see it all worn out. You know? 
couple thousand years ago, and it's still, uh, it's, it's the same thing, um, same way it impacts. And uh, Jonathan Shea, if you, work, if you happen to be working with combat veterans, um, get into Jonathan Shea's work. He, he wrote uh, Achilles in Vietnam and looked at the impact of combat trauma through the lens of uh, the Iliad. And then um, his just gorgeous work is, um, is Odysseus in America and talking about kind of looking at what it takes for a combat veteran to get home through uh, the lens of Odysseus's trials and his 10 years of uh, travels, travels home from the wars. And it's really cool um, to look at, at, those, at those trials as metaphor for what a combat veteran has to do to, uh, to find themselves back home in, in every sense of that word. And so I, I, I recommend that text. Okay, and then moving on to the 20th century, I want to start with, uh, with the granddaddy. Um, pretty clearly, it's Joseph Volpe. Uh, I can't think of anybody who has contributed more to the treatment and understanding of traumatic stress than Joseph Volpe. Um, he was a South African psychiatrist. And uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, he was practicing in um, Johannesburg. And he was working mostly with uh, combat veterans from World War II. And he was doing... Um, therapy <clears throat> and you know if you're doing therapy in in 1950 you were doing psychodynamic therapy so he was having these combat veterans come in and lay down on his on his sofa and talk about their history their dreams their fantasies their their childhood uh, relationships with their parents and, you know what he was finding was that uh those combat veterans were getting worse and you know he, he was he was a a uh, scientist practitioner, he was in the literature, and all the literature was about psychodynamic. But, but uh, by the early 50s, he started um, discovering some of the work that was being done in the United States uh, with Skinner and some of the others around uh, behaviorism, radical behaviorism, starting to look at, you know, getting away from all of this drive stuff and into just, you know, kind of the basics of, of uh, behavioral motivation. And he started corresponding with, uh, with Skinner and some other uh, Americans and they, um, they urged him to come to Stanford and apply for a Ford fellowship. And he, um, in 1955 and 1956, that's what he did. He came to Stanford and he, um, he spent two years there and he set up a laboratory and, um, he was, began working with his first population was with folks that had anger, um, compulsivity and impulsivity around anger. And uh, maybe the uh, one of the first anger management specialists that uh, that there was. And I just love this picture of him. It's a picture of him down um, in the in the West Village right before he died. All the other pictures of him, he looks very staid and uh, and uh, you know shirt and tie and corner room glasses and pocket protector. Uh, I just love this picture. <laughs> and um, so what he did at Stanford is. Ultimately, um, changed changed his work and the rest of the field was that he found that when he took people that had impulsivity and compulsivity with anger, as he helped them to get in a relaxed muscle body and stay in a relaxed muscle body, their anger completely went poof, completely dissipated. And he started understanding that you could not sustain anger when you had relaxation, when it was paired with relaxation. And he wrote about that, some articles about that. He published a book about it. I don't, not a whole lot of people paid it. I think he had some kind of, I'm not sure what happened, but you know, it proliferated a little bit in the, in the late fifties and early sixties. And then it just kind of saw a lot of his work dissipate. Um, and, and he, in that book, um, which was Psychotherapy by Reciprocal Inhibition, um, brought forward this concept of reciprocal inhibition. And reciprocal inhibition is the, it is the epicenter, the battery, the uh, engine. It's what works in trauma treatment. Every single effective trauma treatment uses reciprocal inhibition. 
as the way to, to desensitize or heal trauma. Um, lots of different ways of going about getting it, but every single one of them has this process. And, and Wolpe articulated this in, in very behavioral language um, back in, in 1955 and 1956. And, and he said that when you, when you take a condition stimulus uh, that produces a condition response of anxiety, whatever that condition stimulus is, that it produces the CR of anxiety, stressor. And you pair that stressor with relaxation. You extinguish the condition response. It's hard to make it much simpler than that. I, I am a, a fan of parsimony and Occam's razor, and that is about as sweet and simple as it can get. There is why trauma therapy works. Now, there are lots of trauma therapies out there that, that kind of give lip service to teaching relaxation skills, but never coach clients to leave their office and begin to confront all of those stressors with dialed down arousal, with relaxed body, so that they are desensitizing the impact that, that, that their past has upon their present. And that is uh, it's something that Patrick Bedouins um, a, developed and in, in, took this idea in, in 1990, and he developed a treatment that's called direct therapeutic exposure, where it it helps. Uh, it was idea was to go confront the things which were anxiety pr- producing, and um, it was inconsistent with the use of relaxation. So. Um, it's on, it's on those two folks' shoulders I'm certainly standing with, with forward-facing trauma therapy. Joseph Fulpe, and here's the reason why forward-facing trauma therapy works, is that when you confront all of those CSs that are producing anxiety in the present, um, and with relaxation, not with brute force, because you know instinctually what a person's going to do is they're going to confront with brute force. And when I do this in a, in a training, um, uh, I always kind of do a little example is that let's say that I had a little, um, that my, when I was a kid, when I was a child, my caregivers had all these little African multicolored boxes laying about our house. And when I did something that they didn't like, they whacked me in the head with the box. Bang. And you know, that happened hundreds of times in my development. And if I walked in here to, to do this, to, to start this training, and somebody had left lying on my desk this box, how do you th- suppose I'm going to respond to it? What's going to happen inside of me? I'm going to have arousal, right? I'm going to perceive this as a threat. I'm going to activate. And, you know, if I'm walking down in my behavioral response to a box or anything that's similar to this throughout my entire life has been, you know, if I'm walking down the street and I see a box in the middle of the road, I am going to, uh, I'm going to avoid it. And if I was, you know, if somebody had the box and I was in a meeting with them and they, they gifted me with the box because they thought I liked these, um, then I would have confronted that, but, but I would have confronted it with brute force. I would have forced myself to take this as a gift <clears throat> with energy. And the problem with that is that there's no desensitization. Is that if I am confronting the thing that I'm afraid of with, with heightened arousal, and I'm, my behavioral response reaches the place of, of compulsivity and instinctual response, of aggression or avoidance, or let me out, then what happens is every time I confront this thing for the rest of my life, it produces, it comes up to the same intensity, up to the same level. To start it downward, to desensitize, to lessen the arousal of of the things in our lives that we perceive as threatening, stressors, we need to confront them with relaxed muscle body. So if I take this from, you know, a coworker, they find it out in the hall and come in here and say, Eric, I found this in the hall. Would you like it? And I take it to relax body and I hold on to it, smell it, have a sensory experience with it. Then what happens is the next time I encounter it, it's going to be 50% or less 
intensity as it has been all of those previous times, it's going to sig significantly <laughs> diminish in its capacity to, to generate distress. Um, and that is what we do. And that's, that is direct therapeutic exposure. Um, Volpe used this process to develop probably maybe the most used uh, uh, psychotherapeutic technique of all time is um, systematic desensitization. Uh, it's specifically built around phobia uh, and helping people to, to lessen their, their, their distress uh, when they confront things, when they engage in things, um, public speaking, flying, of helping them to to get a relaxed muscle body and and then you can do the exposure exposure therapy that's Joseph Olpe you hear exposure therapy and trauma that's that all started with Joseph Olpe and exposure and trauma treatment can happen in two ways it can happen in, uh, imaginally which is probably 80% 90% of trauma therapies is where you have the person call up the memory and pair that with a relaxed body. So you are desensitizing the power that that memory has to make one distressed. And then there is in vivo, which is the, the direct therapeutic exposure and, and standing on its shoulders forward facing trauma therapy. We're going to be doing, you guys are going to learn in this course, exposure therapy, but it's going to be exposure in vivo, not imaginally. Seems like there was something else I wanted to say about Joseph Fulpe. Um, but I can't remember what it was. He, uh, he went back to, I think he got a little bit demoralized about, uh, about not being well received in the United States. I don't know that. That's just conjecture on my part. And he went back to South Africa in 1956 and hung out there for a few more years, 58 or 59. He came to UVA. And did a few years there, and then um, and then went to Temple and was at Temple for the rest of his life, um, teaching and, uh, and and continuing to do his work. Um, it is uh, you know a tip of the hat to Joseph Fulpe because everything that we're going we're doing from here on out is uh, sitting on his shoulders. Okay, um, now let me move through some other folks uh, with the 20th century, and this is this is the history of trauma. Uh, According to Eric and Forward Facing Trauma Therapy, these are the folks' shoulders who have influenced um, me to get here. It's certainly not in any way uh, a full-on history of the 20th century of trauma treatment. I, that would be a whole course. But I want to introduce you to some folks that have uh, played a role and have that there's a little piece of them in in um, in trauma in forward facing trauma therapy. So let me start with the person who is probably has had uh, the most impact upon me. It would be a toss up between between these two folks here, um, and that's Charles Figley. And Charles was a Vietnam veteran and um, uh, a Marine in Vietnam, and came back and got his doctorate at Purdue, and um, did some formative research around um, around the impact that that the Vietnam War had upon uh, veterans and was able to describe those uh, symptoms as the Vietnam stress syndrome. He wrote a book about that. And um, through his work and, and the work of several other people, John Wilson and some others, um, that they advocated to the American Psych Psychiatric Association. And that's what produced the diagnosis of PTSD. Um, Charles was a whole lot of ways um, one of the primary advocates that brought about the diagnosis of PTSD. And um, he was the first editor of the Journal of Traumatic Stress. He was the first president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. And he was my dissertation chair. And he and I started, as I said earlier, the Traumatology Institute at Florida State. And um, I would not have a doctorate were it not for Charles. And um, um, we did a lot of work and created some really cool things in, uh, in Tallahassee at Florida State. And um, it was privileged, I'm privileged to get to stand on his shoulders. Um, so moving, I'm going to move clockwise around here. 
Um, this is the Dalai Lama with Herbert Benson. And Herbert Benson took Joseph Fulbe's work and began to apply it across the spectrum um, of diagnoses at, at Harvard. And um, Benson developed the relaxation response and was a strong advocate for that avenue of treatment. Um, and uh, so found that, that relaxation improved um, improved symptom, diminished symptoms across the diagnostic spectrum. Um, so the work that we're going to be doing around self-regulation has uh, some homage to Herbert Vincent's work. Um, this is Francine Shapiro. She's the developer of EMDR. She developed EMDR in 1989 uh, as part of her dissertation project. Um, I uh, was a client uh, of EMDR working with my trauma um, starting in probably 1991 or 1992. And um, I, got, I got trained in 1993 um, in EMDR and, um, and then did uh, level two in 1995 and um, have probably, I'm, certainly more than 5,000, somewhere between seven and 8,000 sessions of the EMDR I've done in my career, a whole lot. And I used to be a, um, uh, an instructor of EMDR, a proof instructor through EMDR, um, and I've trained 1,000 people to do EMDR. Um, and the thing that, that uh, you know, EMDR is, uh, when I do trauma training, I say that if you're in the, the first three quarters of your career, and you're going to be working um, half the time or more with trauma survivors. You need to have EMDR. It's um, in the research. It's not any better than than the narrative techniques, cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure. But it gets the results more quickly, and it is the only treatment out there that lets you work with, especially episodic trauma. Um, child abuse, childhood sexual abuse, um, co multiple combat deployments, um, a career in law enforcement, because there's just so many of those experiences that trying to do narrative, you got to just, it's clunky. Narratives work, but it's, it's four wheel drive. And what EMDR does is allow you to work on whatever the current distress is, whatever the, whatever's going on currently, and it goes and gets um, all of those, all of those intrusive memory fragments that are causing the symptoms in the present. And um, so it's just a much more efficient and effective way of, of treating uh, what we call type two trauma. Um, Lenore Terre's language on that, that it was ongoing and inescapable. Um, but the real reason that, that Francine's up here is that she really is the first um, big dog. Uh, Ron Kurtz did that as well. Uh, oh, I had his picture on another one, and I, I, I have the wrong one up here. And I'll just have to do it, do it by name. But anyway, um, what, what Francine did was articulate a treatment that was a catalyst for self-healing. It was not to heal. It was not an allopathic model. And all the other treatments for trauma are allopathic, which means that they are, that the expert, the physician, the healer has to do something to remove um, disease uh, or fix something structural before the person can, can, can have health. That's a really gross definition of what allopathic medicine is. And, and what the medical model, and, and what Francine did was say, uh-uh, nope, that we live in self-healing organisms. And the real reason why folks that have PTSD are not self-healing is that it's stuck and it's thwarted. And what this, what EMDR does is help the person themselves be able to get out of the way and allow what is already trying to happen to come forward. 
And that ended up being, um, even though she, she uh, said some, some other things about the informational processing model that, that I think got her in hot water and, and set, the, set her back some in, in terms of uh, uh, scientists in the field, um, she really hung to this idea that, uh, that what we were doing was, was helping people to heal. And um, that if if they are out of their threat response system and they integrate and desensitize, let come forward these flashbacks and nightmares, the intrusive symptoms, let those come forward, confront them in a relaxed body, be able to turn those into narrative, to integrate those, then then they don't um, they don't have symptoms anymore, and that's pretty cool. So moving on around um, the the, the uh, clockwork here is. One of my mentors also is Lewis Tennant. I did a, a fellowship with him at West Virginia University School of Medicine. Um, Bessel van der Kolk called Lou the 20th century uh, Pierre Genet and one of the, the, the brightest minds in trauma therapy back in the, in the late 90s and um, early aughts. Uh, Lou developed a treatment model that was basically, he took Pierre Janet's work and, um, and brought it to the 20th century and developed it through a hypnotic process, a really um, elegant, non abreactive way of surgically capturing all of the dissociated material from the trauma and being able to capture that in a narrative, recording that, having the, the survivor watch that back. Um, it was well done. And um, he, uh, he published that right before he died. And um, I am grateful to have stand up, to be able to stand on his shoulders and uh, um, have had him as a, <clears throat> a mentor in my life. Um, the next person here, see, I'll, I'll move this on forward, is Anna Vanderhart, a man that I just love. And... <clears throat> The reason why his work is a pretty big deal is that he, um, in 1992, wrote an article called Abreaction Reevaluated. And in that article, what he did was, you know, the treatments in, in all the way up to the early 90s, <clears throat> the treatment for the primary treatment for trauma was called, I mean, this tells you what we were doing in the name. It was called implosion or flooding. I mean, how many of y'all want to go get imploded or flooded? Yeah, not very many, neither. And it was, it was draconian. It was, it was uh, having people relive and retell over and over and over again the worst parts of the trauma. And for the ones that could withstand it, they got better. But it, it ended up blowing a whole lot of people out of treatment. It overwhelmed them. It re-traumatized them. And the whole rationale theoretical underpinning of flooding and implosion was this was the contamination of trauma treatment by psychodynamic psychotherapy. It was the idea that you had to have a catharsis. You needed to have this expression, this release of, of pent up drive pain to be able to heal from trauma. And Anna said, nope, stop. <laughs> that is not what we need to do. We need to integrate the, the dissociated and suppressed memory fragments. And we can do that relaxedly with hypnosis or, or some other relaxation way. We do not have to have weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth to be able to heal trauma. And, um, and, and he promulgated and championed this idea of, of being able to treat trauma without without re-traumatizing folks. And, and at the same, that was 1992, the same year Judy Harmon published um, Trauma and Recovery. And she, she had the same, same message that, that we don't throw people into their trauma. She promulgated in that book, the, the, the triphasic model where, and, and ultimately what the triphasic model means is that we do not do any memory processing with any of our clients until they are safe they are stable and they have the requisite skills to confront their, their traumatic past without it re-traumatizing them, that they, they possess those skills and are able to utilize them. Um, this is Edna Foa. She took 
um, flooding implosion, tweaked it a little bit to the to the 21st century and called that um, prolonged exposure and has done a lot of research. She has championed a lot of research. She's at the University of Philadelphia <coughs> and um, she, I don't know that EMDR, I've heard, I don't know this to be true, that EMDR is now the most researched psychotherapy in the history of humankind. But man, I, I, gotta, I gotta believe that uh, prolonged exposure is not very far behind because they've done a good deal of research. It's pretty simple to research. It's straightforward treatment. It is exposure paired with relaxation, recently more so than in the past. More and more and more, it has gravitated its focus to to making sure we get the relaxation end of the exposure um, taken care of. And then, and then being able to create narrative about that. Um, and so EMDR, prolonged exposure. Uh, this is Patty Rezik, and she is the developer of cognitive processing therapy. And this is Donald Michael Baum, which is a developer of stress inoculation training and several other methods of, um, of trauma treatment that are cognitive behavioral. And so those are the four ABTs, really the big ones, um, EMDR, prolonged exposure, uh, cognitive processing therapy, and then stress inoculation training and other CBT approaches. So that's where we are 20, uh, 21st century is we've got four primary high, uh, good recommendation according to VA DOD's guidelines for treatment, four highly rated, uh, uh, recommended, and with good research of binding that is effective with trauma treatment, 86% using one of those with a, somebody who's trained in one of those methods using an EBT um, and treating somebody that has met diagnose, diagnostic criteria for PTSD. That is much, there are, there's a study that was done two years ago uh, that 86% positive prognosis um, when you match those up. That's pretty good. That's, uh, I'm grateful that I've lived long enough that my, that my clients can expect you know, uh, closer to 90% uh, recovery from the, from going through a course of treatment with me. And that's grateful that I've lived long enough to do that. Last two folks on this, three folks, uh, four folks, is uh, this is Vincent Felitti. He is a developer of the ACE, which is the Aversive Childhood Experiences uh, Scale. And hopefully this is not the first time you've heard of the ACE. If it is, I was going to put it in this course, but it just was going to string it out and make it too long. So it's not in here. Um, but I would, I would urge you to either take our, our, um, our trauma competency in the 21st century course or um, get on ACES, A-C-E-S, uh, T-U-D-Y, acestudy.org and learn about the ACE. And it's, um, it's an instrument that measures aversive childhood experiences. There's 10 items and it's binary. So yes is one, um, no is zero. And what we've learned about the ACE is that the higher the score, the more at risk you are for every single bad healthcare outcome that, there, that you can think of from lung disease, liver disease, heart disease, um, just uh, autoimmune disorders, uh, just early death, and all of the mental health. Um, really interesting statistic. Um, men with sco A scores of six or higher are 46 <laughs> times more likely to use IV drugs, 12 times more likely with a score of four to commit suicide. Um, it's really interesting research and it's changing everything. If you've heard the, the phrase trauma-informed care, that's from Vincent Flitty. This is Sandy Bloom. Um, she and Lou were, were big buddies. Sandy started uh, Friends, uh, the sanctuary at Friends Hospital in Philadelphia. And it was the first inpatient treatment in the United States was specifically directed towards towards the treatment of traumatic stress and has um, uh, 
um, her, her book, Creating Sanctuary, is one of the, the best, best texts that I've ever read on trauma. She takes it from the micro and looks at the history of being what's happening inside of the, the individual and then moving that into cultural and seeing the ways that trauma affects culture. And that's a really cool perspective. And she's done some, some excellent work with that, looking at art as trauma narrative and just some really cool work. And then finally, um, just a, a nod, especially with the DSM-5. Um, the DSM-5 has integrated a whole lot more ever than ever before dissociation. Um, dissociation was was kept in from in the DSM process was kept separate from there was traumatic stress and there was dissociation and scientists practitioners worked with with traumatic stress the woo woos worked with dissociation and um, you know in, in the DSM five we now have it's it's integrated uh, that that you know they've capitulated that that PTSD is a dissociative disorder intrusive symptoms are are dissociative symptoms. Um, we PTSD now is a modifier with or without dissociative features. And so this is Cornelia Wilbur, who was Sybil's therapist, who brought, you know, before Cornelia Wilbur, the, the, the treatment du jour for, for multiple personality disorder was, was uh, exorcism. And um, she really brought a um a studied and relational um and clinical treatment to dissociative disorders <clears throat> and standing on his her shoulders was richard cluft i probably had to have a picture of him in here too but that that's you can see this is the shoulders of the folks upon who i'm standing um to to be able to offer you uh, forward-facing trauma therapy. Mm, can't get this out of the way.